when, when Michael, you're the king of pop, yeah, yeah. man. You can do all this stuff, you know, the locking and stuff like that, all these different things. I could I could modify what you're doing. I go, do this move that you're doing in the dance. You did the move. And I said, all you have to do is change this, adjust this a little bit, and it's a martial arts move. What's up, guys? Today's guest is a world-renowned martial artist and fight and stunt coordinator. Please welcome to the Jamcast, Mr. Jeff Amata. What's up, Jeff? Hey, man. How's it oh, going? Oh, man, this is a honor and a pleasure. We've been, uh, I've been trying to get you on this for so long, and uh, it finally worked out. So thanks for making the time. No, it's a pleasure. <laughs> it's kind of crazy, too. I, I feel like I haven't seen you in forever, and it's interesting because I, like, calculated it, and I feel like I've spent almost two to two and a half years of my actual life with you on set <laughs> over all the jobs we've done. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. It's cool. Yeah. <laughs> it is cool. And more than anything, I just have to thank you for that, for that opportunity, which is, which is kind of surreal. Like, um, you actually gave me my first job ever on a SAG feature film. I'd done like TV before, but you gave me my first job on a SAG feature film on the green Hornet way back in the days. Oh yeah, that was a fun show. It was it was good having you too. Yeah, it was fun, and I'll never forget like uh, some of the gas deaths were like way more fun to do than taking real flat backs and stuff because you could just fall from the gas. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> oh, oh. yeah, that was a change of yeah, pace. <laughs> totally yeah. different. And then fast forward to um, you know, I have to thank you again for this. You were the first one to take me on my full first full like run when you took me down on. Twilight Breaking Dawn 1 and 2 down in Baton Rouge. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was an interesting <laughs> show. <laughs> I've referenced it a few times on this show, and, like, what was so unique about it was that we put in probably some of the longest days I've put in on a set. We were, like, on set, like, 14 to 18 hours every day, like, for f consecutive days in a row. It was crazy. I know. It's because of driving to the locations and then having to put all the makeup and and contact lenses and everything else and you know being being a, being a vampire and everything so and then they had to redress the sets when there was snow and and uh yep and all the scrambling to try and find a quick way to do gags and set up wire stuff and things and you know what what's surreal about that job that i've referenced on this show so many times is that like when you look at the people that you were able to collectively get into one place at once i mean you had like an all-star list of performers like that still to this day blows my mind like i don't think there will be another show i'm on where you collectively have that many people from like rich to strone to like freddie b to aaron tony like anise sherfa like you have guys now that are like stunt coordinating their own projects you have people that are like some of the one x like doubles of the world, like as superheroes, like how did you get that group together? Like, I know, it, was, it was just really fortunate, you know, to get to just get the phone calls out and and then you know get referrals because some of the guys I didn't really know that well either. Some of them were pretty new, but super talented. So, um, so I was just really lucky to get everybody. And yeah, it was a really great group of talented guys and, and gals. So it was we had a uh, we had a good team together, you know, so, cause, and plus we had to work fast and put stuff together fast. So, you know, you had to have the talent. So it was, it was yeah, really it was super cool. I mean, even just down to guys that you had like assisting besides, uh, like assisting fight coordinating, I think you had like Pong there and you had Guillermo there and then like rigging wise, I mean, you had Hugh O'Brien and Roel and you even had Jason Domenico before his like action factory blew up, you know? It's I know. Yeah. Mike, Mike Lee. Lee. Mike Lee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. put, the, put that big old grid up there with, we ran it like a, like a stage. We were like, have, you know, kit wires and everything, come cable coming down all over the place and pull stations, you know, one central pull station. So it was, it was, we had to really come up with a good plan to figure out how to do stuff on the fly. It, you know, was, real quick. it was a unique show for sure. And it was, it was actually during that time when it was kind of like at the beginning of the tax incentives for Louisiana and stuff like that. And so like, I remember it was just like such a unique experience because it, we were working with a lot of new people, even in production wise, and it just kind of compounded the fact of how difficult it was. And even the cities we were shooting in weren't set up to have productions. We were shooting on like an old, arena used for like uh livestock shows <laughs> yeah 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 livestock and rodeo and stuff i think and and then we had to 
take care of the, the you know the grounds and everything so that we didn't you know uh, you know mix different stuff in with the soil and, and make it really hard difficult for them to do their thing afterwards and yeah I was um in a lot of yeah new people that you know that weren't super experienced on the show for in production and it was just uh yeah it was you know kept us totally and you know what's funny of all, of all the things that happened on the show which 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 there are numerous amounts of things that happened i remember one time i was doing a scene where in midair i got hit by an extra and got like taken out in midair which was crazy um but the one thing I'll never forget, which is so funny to me, is I remember us being on this. At the time, Twilight was like one of the biggest blockbuster, blockbuster franchises in the world. And I remember for one of our second meals, because everything was closed in this small town, they brought McDonald's cheeseburgers, <laughs> McDonald's hamburgers, and fries. <laughs> I know. It's like, yeah, this super huge blockbuster and, you know, and uh, we're getting like the cheapest food for a second meal. <laughs> and to be fair, though, and then, night, and then we're rehearsing at night, yep. right? Yeah, yeah, uh, we're rehearsing at night, and then can't get you know. It's like, okay, where's our meal? It's like, and you go, oh, everything's closed. Well, I mean. Guys, you have to provide meals. <laughs> we still be, yeah, it was crazy because, like we said, like back in the day, these cities just weren't ready to have full on productions. Whereas, you know, now if you shoot in like a city like Atlanta, they have the infrastructure set up to handle big crews, big casts, and stuff like that. But early days in Louisiana, man. Yeah, that was it was an interesting show. It was, I mean, it was fun with everybody, but the, the other aspects there was pretty interesting. <laughs> production side <laughs> we we've had some interesting experiences on many shows we won't talk about them on here because uh, we're not here to blast people <laughs> but we love the business <laughs> <laughs> says says the guy that knows i'm constantly looking at an extra strategy <laughs> Oh man, but yeah, no. More than uh, more than anything, you know, like I said, I owe a lot of uh, a lot of credit to you for giving me the opportunity early on in my career, and I've learned so much. A lot of people always ask me how I've gotten the chance to start fight coordinating early on in my career, and really, I credit you to learning so much by just giving me the chance to just shadow you uh, when I was so young and in a position where I was just eager to just learn everything from you. And every time I work with you, I'm blown away. You'll you'll teach me something new where I just feel so stupid that I didn't know that already, uh, even on the last film we did in Boston just the stuff that you were showing me with the way that you were setting up glass for it to blow out and stuff or just wedging things underneath statues for them to fall over easier I was like wow well <laughs> this, is, this is why this man gets paid more than me <laughs> no I've just been in the business too long I think <laughs> <laughs> and do you know how long you've been in the business officially like if I remember correctly you started as an extra right yeah, did extra work for like a year and then um, got my SAG card. So it was back in probably when I was three, I think, um, in 1978. <laughs> I was like, dang, you look good. <laughs> I only know how old you are because you and my mom were born in the same year. So <laughs> yeah, now everybody else I know, <laughs> if they know your mom, <laughs> your mom. Your mom's only 35, so it's like... <laughs> I mean, you and my mom are insane. You both have, like, perfect like perfect heads of hair that, like, literally, like, you can't see gray on, which is insane to me because, like, you know, you guys you guys have aged extremely well, and it's probably a credit to how active you are still, you know, so... Uh, there's some there. <laughs> but your mom, yeah, your mom looks... She's, she's unbelievable. Your mom's, you know... That's, you got good genes, I tell you. <laughs> Try to stay young forever, Jeff. I'm trying to stay young forever. Um, and now, correct me if I'm wrong. Like, um, this is the first credited uh, credit on your IMDb, so it may not actually be the first one. But your first uh, SAG stunt job on your IMDb is the original Blade Runner. Was that your actual first SAG job, or did you work some before that? I did something before that. Um, yeah, I did something before that. I got my SAG card, and I can't. What was the name of that show? Uh, it was a Hal Ashby movie. <laughs> Long time. Yeah. Um, yeah. What was the name of the show? Um, yeah, I can't remember the name of the show off, off the top right now. But, but yeah, it was back in 78, I think, or 79. So, 78, yeah. Um, 
So, but yeah, I was like, I got converted on the show and I was like, you know, had to fall, <clears throat> get knocked into a table, got crashed into, and I had to fall off the fall, fall with the table and crash, you know, and just wreck and stuff. So, and, uh, I was on that show for, for a few, for a few weeks. Yeah. For quite a while. So, That's awesome. That's but, awesome. and then, then I was thinking at the time I was thinking of going into, um, being a, going to camera operating, you know, because back then I think they had like an apprentice type situation, but, but, uh, ended up doing acting and then doing stunts on the side. And then pretty soon cause they're waiting for interviews for acting and then kept getting more stunt work and then, you know, ended up doing more stunts than acting. No way. Yeah, I was just going to ask you if you had always dreamt of doing stunt work, but it seems that you actually went into the industry trying to act first and then just kind of fell into stunts as more of a, a viable career in the long term. Well, I love, I like both because one's physical and challenging in a physical manner. And then the other one's more, you know, as an actor, it's a different type of challenge, you know, um, sort of a more character and, and, you know, with dialogue and things like that. So it was both, both were interesting and challenging to me. And I like, and a lot of times they're combined doing stunt acting parts. So, you know, so that was always sort of a, a plus for me to be able to do both and, okay. and for the coordinators or for production either way, because then they didn't have to double me and stuff like that. <laughs> find, a, find an actor that could do, you know, find, find somebody that could do the lines while I do stunts. <laughs> That's crazy. And now before we get like too far into your stunt career, which is literally absolutely insane, like we could literally do a podcast with you every day talking about how many jobs you've done. Um, I know your first official stunt job was in 78. Um, so I kind of just want to like backtrack before we go there and just kind of talk about your martial arts background. Now, I think you started uh, from what I've read is in 1970, you started in Taekwondo and Kempo. And then in 1973 is when you stumbled upon uh, training with Dan Inosanto, but this is back when it was actually called the Filipino Cali Academy before Inosanto Academy, right? Yeah, yeah, I met Danny in 73 and then um, really was hitting it hard in 74 when, you know, because uh, I met him in the latter part of 73. And yeah, it was a Filipino Cali Academy out in, out in Torrance, you know, or Harbor City. It was like right in, right, in, right around there. So, but um, yeah, it was a, pretty magical time, you know. Um, unfortunately, I didn't meet Bruce, Bruce Lee, but um, but you could feel his, his, his essence, you know, his spirit there. And it was like a very, um, uh, it was funny, you go in to go train there and, and um, you know, you've, you've going to school and stuff at the time and if you had a long day, you go in there and all of a sudden you walk through the door and you get hit with this wave of, of energy, and, you know, and you're just energized to train. And, and there'd be also some funny, you know, weird stuff going on there because a lot of times late and we stay late afterwards and then you'd be sitting there talking and all of a sudden a huge heavy bag would start moving by itself. <laughs> You're like going, okay, well, somebody's here visiting us. So. That is wild. And for those that don't know, like what we're referring to, uh, Guru Dan is is basically critically acclaimed as like Bruce Lee's number one student and kind of like continues on the lineage of JKD and everything like that. How, how did you stumble upon meeting Dan? Was it with the intention of training with him because of his association with Bruce or how did you actually like come in contact with that? Yeah, that was, yeah, that was it. It was mainly, you know, because of course everybody was interested in Bruce Lee. And so I just it was, you know, a uh, buddy of mine and I were <clears throat> motivated to try and find him and stuff. And, and uh, train with train with Danny and hopefully meet Bruce Lee or something. But um, you know, uh, so, but Danny's yeah, Danny's a you know he's one of a kind. He's so knowledgeable and I mean he's, he's before meeting Bruce, he trained in all kinds of disciplines before that and was you know he was a 101st Airborne, so he was in the military and he used to train with people in the military and they used to exchange and spar and, and do stuff even in the military and growing up in Stockton he had a lot of he had, his next door neighbor was a Japanese guy who taught judo so he learned judo from that guy and you know I had un plenty of a lot of uncles you know that taught screaming and Kali so um so he's he's been doing it 
you know, since she was really young. And then he was just pretty much of a star athlete growing up on top of that, you know, like track star, football, football star. So, um, so he's been athletic through his whole life, but he's and he trained with Ark, Ark Wong. And, you know, I mean, he's just got such a diverse background even before he met Bruce. So, I, so it was good, you know, he did learn from Bruce, but I like to say that they were, they were um, good friends and, and, you know, training partners because they used to trade ideas and stuff. And, and uh, Dan used to um, keep, keep all the notes and keep everything organized. And, and you know, cause Bruce was pretty much leaving a lot of the traditional stuff behind. And so, but Dan would, you know, keep, keep all the notes and everything to keep it organized, to be able to teach everything. That's cool. And now I know one of the things that like, I'm kind of jealous of that I missed, uh, being born in the generation that I was born in is, is something that my parents always allude to, too, how they say, like, man, we would get arrested or sued if we trained the way that we used to train back in the days. And I know you guys did some very unique training back in the days, and it was mostly centered upon, like, self-defense and actual physical fighting and stuff. I've read stories that you guys used to do, like, uh, two-on-one fights, three-on-one fights. You'd fight in the dark on purpose, like, to just cast shadows and shadow fight each other and stuff like that. Um, yeah yeah it was it was pretty unique time i mean i know even dan talks about it now he goes man we used to do some crazy stuff back then he goes we couldn't do that now we'd get arrested (laughs) we'd get sued or something so because yeah we literally it was very much um uh we're it was that that's is the training method was pretty much ahead of the ahead of its time and we did we used focus gloves when people didn't you know any you know didn't really use focus gloves we used you know, kicking shields, which there were no kicking shields. Dan, that was Dan's contribution from from playing football. So he had, he had you know, shields for playing football, and you use that for kicking. And uh, and then you had like, you know, like we put on, we go full contact with weaponry, and uh, but there's no no protective gear back then. So it was like you take it. There's some pictures of us after we're training, and you know, we're all like, it's like a you know, there was no official uniform except a t-shirt. We could wear anything else. And we wore shoes back then. And most people didn't wear shoes. We trained on the concrete. We throw people to each other on the concrete. Um, <clears throat> we'd, we'd spar once, at least once a week, you know, and then we'd go full contact with weaponry every so often, you know, quite often. And we'd experiment, like you said, you know, two on one, three on one, you know, two on three, you know, it's in, in the dark I and mean, we do different elevation training. We, you know, guys would be standing on a bench and guys would be down below and you have to stay on the bench and not fall off and, or fight in linear on a bench or, you know, on a, get, there's a line we put on the ground and you have to stay on the line and fight and a lot of diff, different things just to, just to hone our skills and, ex, and also a lot of experimentation, you know, and, and weight class with nothing, everybody sparred with everybody. I'd be, <laughs> I'd be sparring against guys that were six, three, six, four, you know, and weighed over 200 pounds. And, you know, it's like, and, uh, it was, but everybody was really, everybody in our, in the JKD group, um, class, uh, group was for the senior class was really, um, very respectful and always wanted to have a good time. So it'd be funny. We'd be sparring and hitting each other and guys would be apologizing as they're sparring. It's like, Oh, I'm sorry, man. It's okay. Keep going. You know, keep going. It's okay. And so, so it was a lot, it was, it was really a lot of fun. Nobody had, everybody was really cool headed and, and just wanted to train hard. And if, and if there are better people training, you know, if you're sparring somebody that was better or not as good as you, they they make sure that it was a good training experience and not just, you know, beat the crap out of you kind of thing because you know you could. But um, so it was it was a it was a very um, unique time and um, a lot of people used to come by and visit. There were you know fourth fifth degree black belts that were really well known in the, in the martial arts world and and come in and train and, and you know take classes or some kind of just come by and visit. And it was, um, it was a very, um, it was like a hub for a lot of people because of Dan and all, you know, and Bruce Lee, you know, people wanted to always come in and see how, how Bruce used to, you know, the training would go and things like that. So it was, um, it was a lot of fun, but yeah, we, we, um, we do, you know, Dan would 
there'd be like dislocated fingers and somebody would dislocate their shoulders and Dan would set the fingers and the shoulders and stuff. But you know, now he would never do that. But back then, you know, we were all like, you know, we all knew that we were going to get our bumps and bruises. So we sort of like, you know, just that was part of it. You know, we just sort of, you know, went through it and, and it was, um, and nowadays it's, it's not, quite you know it's not like not like that it's there's still some schools like that but it's it was very much the you know old school method where you know you're training martial arts you're going to get banged up so totally, totally. You know, that's how you learn totally and now just to put it in perspective like i know you're one of the, uh you know you're certified instructor in jkd which is not something that gets passed out easily to a lot of people how many days a week were you training at that point and how long was it before you were actually like deemed an instructor in the system um, I started, well, I was going at least, at least twice a week, sometimes three times a week and, and, uh, sometimes even four, but if I, at least twice a week, I'd be there from like, yeah, I think like six to like 10 at night or something. And even after that, we, you know, we close up and once you're in the senior class, you'd stay and you stay later and then we'd go eat and come back and, train and then hang out with, with Dan and um, um, uh, and I call him Dan because I've known him you know not out of disrespect or, you know call him Gru or um, you know but uh, or Sifu or, or something but but the thing is he's it's I've known we've known each other so long that and we used to travel together that he used to just call me Dan. So it's, so it's not out of disrespect. <laughs> they call him Dan. So, but, um, yeah, we go eat and then come back and sometimes, you know, a lot of times go to his house and if we did weight training, you know, the weights in his, in his garage. And so it was like, so I was there quite a bit and, and I was going to school at the time. So it's sort of, I get home late and then start studying around two in the morning, <laughs> one or two in the morning. But, but, um, so I'd say I, I was going, I was there quite often. And then I um, probably started teaching probably around 78. Uh, and I, right, yeah, probably about 78. And I said I started the business in 78, but I think I got my SAG card in 79. But um, it could have been, some, I don't know, somewhere on there. But, but, um, but I started teaching around 78, and that was through the... Um, persuasion of from Danny to some <laughs> encouragement he kept saying you should start teaching but you know I mean I was not the senior person there there is other guys that were there too that were there a little bit you know, longer than I so I said they should be teaching and he says well and the thing is at that point in time even the senior JKD group um, he would tell us you guys are my senior you guys should be teaching and everybody just said no there's so much more to learn we don't want, we don't want to teach you know we, but um but uh, he, he talked me, it took him like six months to talk me into, you know, assisting him and start teaching. And, um, and then I was traveling with him too. So, so it was probably around 78 that I really was um, probably made an instructor um, back around then, 78, 79, I think, full instructor. Okay. Okay. And now on top of all the things that you've done and accomplished, you've also released two books, the Bali Song Manual and the Advanced Bali Song Manual. Where did you actually pick up that training? Was that through Dan or was that through your own independent studying on that? Um, I was introduced to that probably in um, elementary school. <laughs> because of one of the guys I hung out with, maybe it was junior high, elementary school, I think sixth grade or something, sixth grade. Uh, one of my friends, his brother was in the service and came back with some knives and sort of like, he goes, hey man, so we started playing around with it back then. Uh, and that was completely separate from me ever knowing I was going to go into the Filipino arts and, and have related to the Bali song. But um, when the book was coming about, uh, I, was work I started helping out at um, uh, Bali song. The, the, Les Diasis was making butterfly knives and his, his company was called Bali Song then and changed to Pacific Cutlery but he came in and you know, wanted uh, some advice to help find somebody who can help show you know do more demonstration with the knife and things like that he was a he was Filipino he was a machinist he knew he, you know he knew about the knife but not 
not a whole lot. So he was trying to get more educated. And, and Dan was, uh, Dan one basically wanted me to do it. And I, you know, he sh- I told Dan he should do it, but he said, you should go do it. But, um, so I was advising with him and, um, and helping design some things and stuff like that. And giving my two cents, but, um, I'd say that, um, it's probably, probably, um, and I learned some op- more openings from Dan, but I think a lot of it was just my exploration and, you know, seeing some of the old men do stuff and things and then, and then trying to get more fancy with it because, you know, back then it was not about how flashy you totally, could totally. be. It's more like, it's more like well, how fast you can get it open and use it. <laughs> you had to use it kind of thing. It's more about efficiency rather than, um, flowery moves and you know flashiness and stuff although the flashiness would help deter some people sometimes you would hope but um but now you know and now it's got this new resurgence of all these kids doing it um and doing all these twirls twirls. you know thing and yeah and throwing it in the air and stuff like that which i did some but these guys are now just phenomenal it's like unbelievable although they're not they don't necessarily have a sharp edge weapon uh, blade in there but you know and back then we didn't have blanks <laughs> <laughs> they were all real all real <laughs> everything was sharp yeah, so. totally and now besides the the bali song i know you also had uh like some uh, you know you you were pretty much involved in helping i don't know you can maybe explain this better so that we we know but i know that you also helped uh, as far as like popularizing and really utilizing like telescopic batons Oh yeah, yeah. There was back then. There was like a shorter, um, and not very rugged, you know, well-made um, uh, telescopic baton. It was probably maybe I don't know, sixteen inch, fifteen inches long or something, or 12, 12, 15, 12. It was pretty short, and it was coming in from Japan, and um, and there was hardly not that many people knew about it, but. I just always felt that that was a weapon that would be, could you be utilized by law enforcement in, over in the States quite well, you know, but it had to be made better. So I uh, started ha- manufacturing it, uh, found somebody in, and asked a buddy of mine, and uh, we found a machinist that could make it and got some special alloy uh, tubing and stuff like that so it wouldn't bend and wouldn't break. And I tested it, tested a lot of them early on by um, trying to and swing it at a telephone pole, you know, just hitting it as hard as I could and see if it bent or broke or came off and, and came up with a pretty good design that um, that was pretty reliable and you could put it away. And then, uh, but, and I was introducing it to a lot of friends that I knew with, with LAPD and sheriffs and different things like that and trying to get it to the red tape. But but back then, you know, everybody, well, even still, they, they worry about liability issues. And the worst thing that you can see on a, in a clipping in a newspaper or on the news is if somebody's swinging down <laughs> or just swing, swinging something, hitting somebody with it. So they are sort of interested, but not, you know, they're not at that point in time, it was a little bit maybe uh, a lot of bureaucratic red tape that was too, too hard to get through or, or would take a long time. So I sort of uh, was manufacturing and selling it on the side, and then, uh, but, uh, and then ASP, uh, who, manu- who does a lot for law enforcement now, and, uh, and also uh, uh, Manadnock later, but ASP basically approached me and, and um, wanted to know if they could buy my design because they started manufacturing it a few years later. And, uh, but theirs would bend when you hit something. I got one, I got a couple of them. When I hit the telephone core, I hit anything, it would just bend and it was like, then it was done. So, uh, but I ended up not, I probably should have gone with them, but I didn't go with them and make a deal. And, but I ended up quit. I ended up stopping my manufacturing and selling because I just, the liability insurance and everything else at the time. And I started working a lot more so in the business. So it was sort of like, and put it more in the back burner, but but I did bring it on a lot of shows and introduce it on a lot of movies, you know, like Big Trouble in Little China, a lot of TV shows, TJ Hooker, Hunter, you know, um, uh, Matt Houston. I'm dating myself now. But last show <laughs> where, where I, you know, be the bad guy and I have pull out different weapons, and uh, so it got popular back then. And now, you know, now you see, especially guys on 
to start, you know, I, I was thinking guys who are undercover and have to be helpful and, and guys who are on, you know, guys are on the motor guys that are on the, on the motorcycles, you know, and instead of having big old batons and PR 24s and stuff to have something, you know, more lightweight. Plus, plus the biggest thing was uh, a lot of times I'd be playing a cop sometimes in a, in a, in a show and then you'd have to carry all the GAC on there. You carry your cuffs and your, you know, tear gas and your, you know, your PR 24, your baton and your, your handgun and everything. And you'd be doing a pursuit and you're having all this stuff hitting your body as you're running, you're trying to hold stuff. And I'm just, I'm going, you know, this is, this is why something more streamlined and everything else would be more helpful to a lot of these guys. But, and I'm glad that they're carrying them. Um, and you know, cause it's, cause it's something that's can be utilized and, and drawn and, and shown very quickly. And also it, it could surprise people when you open it and all of a sudden you have this, but you know, this baton coming out. So at the time when it was introduced, you know, we hope, hopefully it would um, deter people from, you know, being more violent and everything else or whatever it was, you know, because of the psychological reason of seeing something just all of a sudden appear. Uh, but it's, um, it's, it's, it's all over the world. Now. That's crazy. And I just, and I probably, like I said, I probably should have, um, utilized it more and capitalized a little bit more. <laughs> Could have retired off selling batons. <laughs> I could probably have been retired by now. <laughs> oh, that's, oh, too, that's funny. too funny. And now segueing from like your martial arts and transitioning over to your, your stunt career, you know, at this point you've amassed over 400 credits. You're a member of the SAG stunt and safety board. You're a member of the Taurus world stunt, uh, stunt like board. You're a member of stunts unlimited. When you first started off though, like what was the industry like being, uh, an Asian stunt performer? Was there a significant amount of work in the beginning? And, and, and what was that like in the early years of your stunt career? Yeah, it was pretty tough early on. I mean, I remember, um, my, I felt like my job, I mean, it was hard to get work. So, you, and I didn't know anybody really. I, it wasn't like I had a connection in the business um, that brought me in to do acting or stunts. So it was pretty much me trying to break ground. And there was not that many Asians really doing stunts or, you know, even it's hard to get stunts and hard to do acting. So, uh, and back then, even the acting, there was basically only two agents that handled all the Asians for acting. And that was it. And they're both Asian agents. So, um, and to get into some of the other agencies was very difficult because people felt like, oh, they don't, you know, they don't need you kind of thing. So, uh, so, and then doing stunts at the time, uh, there were some guys who were very open to minority doing stunts. And then there's a lot of guys who weren't. So there's a lot of painting down of, um, you know, the Caucasian guys, stunt guys playing, you know, Latino, Asian, black, you know, women. I mean, there was a lot of stuff going on back then. So it was, so it was pretty hard back then to um, get work. Plus there's no, even if, when there was work, it was generally only when there was an Asian storyline for a TV show or for a movie. And back then it was maybe one or two shows a season where they do Asian storylines and then movies were very rare. So. So it was sort of, you'd try and, um, you know, I hit, hit the hit the pavement going door to, you know, set to set, trying to introduce myself to people and just hoping you get some work. And then, and then knowing that if I got a job that um, it was not a, you know, it was an opportunity, but also it was, it would reflect, it was also gonna reflect, if I did a bad job, it wouldn't just reflect on me, it would reflect on the fact that I'm representing felt like I'm representing all the Asians, you know, and for the future work, because, you know, it's quite often you'd hear somebody like say, see, you know, I mean, not often, but, you know, if somebody messed up, you'd see, see those, see those Latino guys can't do anything, or, you know, the Asian guys can't do anything. If one guy messes up, so it reflected on everybody. So, so I felt like if I have to do, give 110% to do a good job so that they'll feel comfortable hiring more Asians for, for the future and for, and also me to be hired totally, again. Totally. But if I messed up, then be like, see, those guys can't do anything. So, so then they, you know, you know, you'd be on the back burner and they, you know, kind of thing. And, and, and they, and hopefully they wouldn't do uh, more paint downs, but they, you know, a lot of times they see, they put another, you know, Caucasian guy in there to, to play an Asian part because they couldn't find there's no Asian guys can't do anything or black guys can't do anything. So for the minorities overall, it was, it was, um, 
very um, challenging and competitive. I mean, not competitive as much because there weren't that many of us, but but it was very challenging to try and get a lot of work. And then one thing is, uh, if you did a good job, people would hear about it. And, you, you know, people would always check on each other if they're going to hire you or hire somebody else. And they'd always call each other and say, how'd this guy do? So, so you wanted to do a good job. And also, if you did a bad job, you know, good news travel fast, but, but bad news, if you did a bad job, that, that was like, that traveled like wildfire. We were like, you know, it'd be like, hey man, if this guy ever comes around, don't hire him. Black, <laughs> black. <laughs> so, so, and that with anybody. So you really had to like, you know, be prepared and ready for whatever came up. And that's, and that's, and it's hard because doing stunts, uh, you can do a, a stair fall, you can do a car hit, you can do, you know, get a, you can get shot or anything. And, and it can be different every single time, as you know, because the, the environment may be different or the situation may be different or you may be with, you know, with, you know, you may be you know, doing dialogue with somebody or, or standing next to people or you may be right in the open. And so even if you're getting shot, you know how to get shot and fall down on, on, on the ground. But if you're getting shot on the stairway, then you have to incorporate a stair fall. Or if you're by a rail or something, you have to, you know, maybe incorporate falling over the rail and doing a, you know, a little high fall or a big high fall. So, so you never know exactly, not, not, it's never going to be the same situation twice, exactly the same way. So, so you just really have to be adaptable and, and uh, be able to, you know, li- deliver the goods. That's crazy. And now, I mean, I know it's difficult even now being an Asian in the industry. I mean, just the number of times I've doubled an Asian actor, I can count on my hands because there's that few of them. So I can only imagine how tough it was for you back in the days. One of the other things, though, that that made it difficult or I guess I want to bring up because I know the story behind it, but I want everyone else to hear about it is for your entire duration of your career, you have never cut your hair. And you, <laughs> you went as far as wigging yourself, if I'm not mistaken on that. And so can you just let the people how you got around never cutting your hair for a, a stunt career that stems back to the 70s? Well, you know, um, Asian storylines, after, after Vietnam War and stuff, then, you know, I mean, there's a lot of war, war shows or, you know, TV shows or, or you, you know, play Vietnamese or... Chinese or somebody, but, but, um, yeah, when there's like, you know, Uncommon Valor and, and, uh, Rambo and different things like that, we'd work on, I'd work on those films and, you know, you every come in and get their haircut unless you're, you know, uh, if you're, especially if you're, you know, army, yeah, you know, yeah. you're, you're, then you have to cut your hair, but if you're in the jungle or something like that, you can leave your hair longer. But yeah, it was, it was like, oh uh, yeah, I can work, work. So I, like, I could work, but if I had a helmet or something, I'd sort of pull it back and then pin it up or something and keep the helmet on and make sure it didn't fall off. And then, and then people would say, or well, if you come on the show, you're going to have to cut your hair. And then I, then I went and um, picked up a wig or two and got those cut and then I put, put those on, or sometimes they were nice enough to put a wig on you. And then, and uh, especially if you're there only for a day or two, although sometimes if you come in for a day or two, they still want to cut all your hair off. But, you know, some of the nice hairdressers would, would, if they had time, would put the wig on. And I just thought, well, maybe I'll go pick up some wigs. So I, um, you know, found a place in the valley and bought a couple of wigs and had them cut. And then I put, figured a way how to put it on real quick and make sure they're on secure. And I, and then I go on a show and they go, oh, we're going to have to cut your hair. I said, well, I got a wig. And they go, well, we're not going to, we don't have the time to put it on, put any wigs on. And, you know, if they fall off, we're going to get in trouble. I said, well, I'll put them on myself. I'll come to work in the morning. I'll have have everything ready. And you guys don't have to do anything. And you got way to constant focus on your job, you know, doing your job with all the other actors and stuff like that, rather than messing around with us. And they said, well, and I, remember, I can't remember the hairdresser, but she said, uh, or maybe it's a guy, and he says, if it falls off, we're cutting your hair. He goes, we'll let you try it, but if it falls off, we're cutting your hair. And I said, deal. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I started, and sometimes I would just show up, and you know, I remember one time I was doing a part even, and um, and there was a few of us, and I went in, and the director goes, oh, great. He goes, he goes, well, you know, some of the other guys, because I, I was working on another show, and I came in to her the final look and everything, and the director goes, he goes, well, you're, you know, we've already let a couple guys go with longer hair, so 
you might you have to cut your hair because we can't everybody having a little bit longer hair and it was playing a part and was in um what was it uh showdown in little tokyo okay, okay. and we're playing yakuza guys so i so he goes come back in the and the ad called and said okay they want you to come back with, and show us your haircut and i said okay so i put a wig on short haired wig it was a crew cut wig and i came in and the director goes oh great good you cut your hair and i go yeah <laughs> and then and he goes okay cool and then the ad was a good friend of mine he goes yeah not bad for a rug <laughs> <laughs> the, guy, the director goes what are you talking about he goes that's a wig and the guy because he knew i was coming in that way and the guy, he goes and the director came over and he goes, look, he goes, wait a second. He goes, let me look at that. He goes, well, I don't know. And then I go, no, no, you already signed off on it. So it's like, you couldn't tell the first time. He goes, yeah, okay. So I played played the character through the whole movie wearing a wig. But yeah, I, I've been fortunate. I, I carried, I always carried at least one or two wigs in my stunt bag all the time. <laughs> Just in case, because sometimes, you know, you're ND, you know, driving a car, you're doing something else or in the crowd. And then all of a sudden they say, oh, we want you to, you know, come be be this character instead. And you have to change clothes and all of a sudden you have to have be clean, clean shaven, you know, have, have uh, cropped hair and, you know, have it nice, nicely cut. So then I throw the wig on to be somebody else or a lot of times doubling people. Um, in fact, all the time doubling people because <laughs> they're not... And most of everybody had short hair, so I'd come in with my wigs, and a lot of times the uh, hairdresser would have a wig for the actor, but just in case, I would bring mine so that they would not cut my hair. So, so yeah, I've been very, uh, I've been very conscious of the fact that I wanted to try and stay on top of things so that if something came up, I would keep, keep my hair. <laughs> I don't know why I want to cut my hair, totally. but I think it would be a good enough job, or, you know, if I played a part where it required me to play you know, cut my hair, I'd probably cut it, but I don't know. I just always, plus I didn't know, I didn't know how they would cut your hair, you know, yeah, back yeah. then. So some people, you know, maybe you just want to get it done quick and then, you know, you got a hack job here. <laughs> Not- <laughs> oh, totally. It's like kind of like your signature at this point too. And like, I, I feel like whenever I see you, I recognize you all the time. And, and, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, I want to know if you're recognized for other things, but I would say the two projects that I always hear people bring you up as recognize you in is Big Trouble in Little China and Blade. For some reason, people always point those two out as like, that's Jeff Amata, that's Jeff Amata. <laughs> yeah, those two and Lethal Weapon yes, yes. 4. And uh, yeah, those are probably the biggest biggest ones. Um, but um, yeah, so it's... <laughs> but, yeah, Big Trouble was was a lot was a lot of fun too because um, because that was a show where it was pretty much the majority was Asian cast. Yeah. You know, all the stunts and all the stunt people. Um, There's probably three or four non-Asian cast members, and uh, the rest was all Asian. So, and it was for all the. Um, street fights and all the fights and everything for the gang fights and it was it was it was really like great because we brought together you know all the martial artists and all the different styles and people that were not some some were brought into the business some people were already in the business but it was great to you know hang out all day and and just you know see everybody you know and uh, and also we had in the background and stuff, we had real gang guys too in the background too. So, so sometimes some of the fights, there would there'd be a real fight starting on in the background sometimes. But, but, um, but it was a huge cast, and and, uh, and um, John Carpenter was great to work with, and and that and working with him actually uh, was not opened up opportunities for the future because um, you know, I was helping out on some of the second unit stuff or B unit stuff and. And uh, later, when he did a film after that, he asked me to coordinate, and um, you know, so and I've been coordinating all the films for John Carpenter after after Big Trouble in Little China. So, so it was it, was, it turned into a, a career, you know, big career change for me too. Totally. Is there a stunt in your mind in your performance career that was like the craziest or the most memorable of all the ones that you've gotten to do? Um. That I did myself. Yeah, yeah, performance-wise. Yeah, I did a. Um, there's a couple. I did a uh, car hit 
and uh, and it was for a TV show, and um, <laughs> and a coordinator. Uh, he was driving the car, and you know we talked about the speed, and he goes, oh, "I'd be like, you know, maybe ten or you know, you know, we walked, went through it." And then uh, I was doubling the actor, and I was I was running away. I think I was running away, and then. And then he comes around the corner, and I can hear the the four barrel all of a sudden open up, and he came around the corner. It's like, mm, and I was like, what? and I went, oh, he's coming at, he's coming in hot. <laughs> More than ten. <laughs> he hit me, and I went, and I was supposed to just go up the hood and then come off, yeah, yeah. you know. And uh, he hit me. Pretty, he, he came pretty fast. He was like close to 20, I think, or, 20, you know, somewhere around there. And, uh, or even faster, I don't know, but it was fast. Cause they turned around and I'm like, Oh, and then he hit me and I, I went up the hood, up the windshield, went on top of the roof and it took everything I had to try and not fall off the back. Totally. It just, some my hands are sliding on the roof and everything else. And then he hit the brakes and I shot and it cleared the hood and I just shot right off the whole thing. I might have touched the hood a little bit, but I ended probably like probably 20 feet past the car oh, on the ground. And, um, and I'm laying there and then all of a sudden I hear him jumping out of the car running over and he goes, are you okay? Are you okay? And I'm going, oh my God, did we cut? <laughs> and so I had to do it again. No way, really? Because he thought he so so he ruined the shot by running after you. Yeah, but he ran. He didn't give him time to cut, so he jumped out of the car. <laughs> so then they go, "Oh, we're gonna have to do that again." I'm going, "Oh, okay." <laughs> and, <laughs> and the second time he did it, he came around and he hit me so slow <laughs> that I pushed to try and get myself up. <laughs> And they, but then that and they ended up having to use that. And I'm going, no, that was awful. But you know, like, <laughs> that was one that was I, I thought was a lot, you know, interesting. But I mean, I was fine. It was just I just didn't want to go off the back end of the car. totally. Um, but yeah, he was he was going. I, I remember hearing that four barrel on the car just opening up. It was like, ah, you know, ah, ah. <laughs> I'm going, he's coming. Out. But um, that and then I did like a. 80 foot high fall out of a helicopter for a um, TV show. It's a water, and right? It's in a, into an airbag. Okay. Okay. And we were doing a fight. I was doubling an actor on the, on the skids. And so I was fighting Matt Houston or Lee Horsley's double and stuff. And we're doing a fight on the skids of the helicopter. And we're pitching in and out and weaving around the tree line and stuff like that. But, uh, and all that was fine. And then when we did the high fall, it was pro- it was super windy. <laughs> so as I'm lining up, I'm standing up there, lining up the airbag, and um, you know, it looks it looks about this big for me. From 80 feet, that is high, yeah. It's, you know, but uh, 80, yeah, it was 80, 90 feet, 80, 60, yeah. And then, um, uh, and we had to, and they start rolling cameras. I'd line it all up, they'd roll cameras, and then I'd look back and then we'd, we'd be drifting off the back because it was so windy. So we spent quite a while trying to line it up to get it stay, to stay there. And they're like getting ready to throw in the towel because they go, you know, what do you think? Is it too windy? And I'm going, well, if you can hold it there, you know, after we roll long enough, you know, let's, let's just try it one more time. So, so um, there is, I think about three takes or four takes I think into it, um, or at least three. Uh, we got to finally got it to where the helicopter would stay there long enough for me to jump off. But, but that was um, that was an interesting yes uh, job because because you know you don't have a plat you're not it's not a stationary platform and the helicopter is moving around and under normal circumstances you know the guys are really good they can just hold it there and you know pretty st- rock steady but. It was at old um, Indian Dunes, which is not there anymore. But um, but yeah, it was super windy that day. And then and then I did the fall, and um, and I never told him that I never did an eighty foot high fall before. Or did that high fall before? <laughs> so and then I started getting calls all the time for high falls. I was like age guy to do the high falls. Cause, so I don't know if you know because nobody went that high. Yeah. yeah. There was very rare, rarely, it was very rare for Asians to have to do any high falls because 
you know, you're either the bad guy or doubling the good guy. I mean, you know, doubling the bad guy who's getting killed or something. Or you're a ninja. <laughs> <laughs> or you're a ninja. <laughs> yeah, but, but um, yeah, so I started getting calls to do high falls all the time, you know. In fact, one day I was at home and I got a rush call to do a high fall. And it was downtown, it was like 90 feet or something. And, um, and it was like, they go, what are you doing? I go, I'm paying some bills right now. I'm just, you know, and so I think, okay, cool. Are you available to work? I said, yeah, we'll come down downtown. If you want to do a high fall, I go in. They go, right now. I go, right now. <laughs> they go, yeah, get over here. So um, so I went down and they had, um, the airbag was all set. Because what happened was somebody else was supposed to do it, but they decided to go higher and he didn't feel very comfortable. And it was like, originally, I think it was probably 30 feet or 20 feet, 20 or 30, feet, 25 feet or something. And then they went to the, pick this other building that was really tall. So, so, um, so I went out there and they said, okay, you want to take a look? So I'd go up and look, look from the top, line up the bag. And then they said, okay, go get changed. I went and changed, put on a wig or whatever, came back, the roll cameras, jumped off the roof. And he said, okay, you got one more. And I said, yeah, I'll do one more. Boom. Okay. Okay. You're wrapped. And I was like in and out, like, within a couple of hours. <laughs> that's, that's I, and I talked to, and it was funny because I had worked with Dar Robinson and, and uh, on some, some shows and we were talking about that. And, and I said, Dar, do you like high falls? He goes, no, man, I like, there's other stuff I like to do more. He goes, but I keep getting called for high falls. And I go, yeah. He goes, how about you? I go, he goes, you've done some high falls. I said, yeah. He goes, do you like them? I said, not necessarily, but I just can't get called for them. I mean, it wasn't as much as him because, like I said, Asians weren't called that often for high falls. But, but yeah, I was like the guy who did call for all the high falls. Because nobody else would, you know, I mean, guys would do them shorter, but I was the guy who would do all the big high falls. Totally, totally. And I, at one point I thought, you know, when I did the one out of the helicopter, uh, I felt like, okay, I've got to set, set a limit for myself. Because, you know, a lot of guys would say they got a big adrenaline rush and all that stuff. but. But I did that high fall, and what surprised me was that I didn't get, I didn't have that rush. It was like, it was like over, and I went, oh, okay. <laughs> so, you know, so I said, I go, I can see why guys would keep going higher and higher. And I said, okay, I'll set my limit at 100. And if they want somebody to go higher than 100, then they can call the guys who are specialists and doing high falls, the guys who are ex, ex uh, you know, cliff divers or different things or, you know, had guy diving experience. And guys who are just really natural in the air all the time that were super comfortable that can go 150 feet or whatever. And I just figured, you know, 100 is plenty high enough and I'm just going to set that at a limit. So, and, but luckily I never went, nobody ever asked me to do anything higher than 100. But <laughs> I've never, I've never jumped that high at all. I, I did my first ever 40 foot one on set. That I didn't tell them that I'd never done one before, and I got up there and I was like, "Oh, this is kind of high. <laughs> this is this. I I didn't. I definitely haven't practiced this before. But yeah, to to get a call like that to eventually work your way up to a hundred is insane. I mean, even to this date, there's not many people that get called to do those. You know, occasionally you got like you know, like you said, Dar Robinson, Bob Brown did some big ones and stuff like that. But it's like, yeah, to, once you get past thirty or forty, that's it's a very 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 small sector of people that specialize in that stuff. So. Yeah, and and it was I don't know if I don't know if anybody else is, as far as Asians have gone that high, but you know, and because after that they started coming out with descenders and decelerators and things like you want to line, yeah. There was a window where we would do. I mean, fortunately, I mean, good. It was good and bad, but fortunately, when I came up, everything was real. You know, I mean, there was no wire assist if they had wire at that time it was piano wire which <laughs> you, could just you know so because and they did, couldn't green they couldn't erase it because yeah. visual effects wasn't that sophisticated yet so pretty much all the stunts we did was were real st you know real stunts without assist without assistance and stuff so um so i i was fortunate to go through that period and and, and actually come out okay yeah, for real some guys, a lot of guys got banged up really bad, and even you know, you know, you know getting getting pulled off saddles and different things like that. And back then, there was no, no. Uh, I mean, everything. There's no. I mean, they would just tie a rope around their leg. 
you know, saddle, you know, get yanked off his saddle, you know, so like, it was like, and then <laughs> just grin and bear it, you know, like they, they say, okay, you got one take, you guys better get this one because I don't know if I can do it again. <laughs> so, but, and there's, and that was like, you know, they, there's a lot of experimentation. I mean, even with cannons and, you know, and uh, stuff like that. I mean, you know, Hal Needham and them would like body run down and body bass and, and uh, punch the guys like, but Hal Needham, you know, putting a, putting a, uh, putting a, like basically a, a jet engine in the car, you know, and, you know, and, and doing stuff or, can, or doing a cannon, not knowing how much black powder to put in to, to flip a car, you know, and just experimenting with stuff. So there's a lot of experimentation going on back then to try and come up with new stuff. Yeah, even, yeah, even. And now, you know, now you got pneumatic, you know, stuff and, you know, everything's assisted by, by air and, and you have your safety off with, you know, with cables and stuff to do stuff. And, and, I mean, you can get, you, you're pushing the limit plus integrating it with special effects visual effects and stuff like that so so you, you that's why you're getting a lot of these cool you know cool wrecks and cool cool action scenes because you're integrating technology with with visual effects and, and modern special effects and stuff and, and a lot of talented guys who are really good and good naturally in the air and uh you know doing wire work and stuff to get all this these really big gags gags accomplished totally yeah, even down to pad technology. Like, I mean, you've shown me some of the pads you have in your stunt bag. There was like stuff that you jerry rigged back in the day. And I'm like, this is what you wore on your back? Like now we're spoiled with gator backs from motorcycle companies and even pads made specifically for stunts at this current day and age. And, you know, D3O material that hardens on impact. And you guys were literally just picking and choosing parts from different football pads and just trying to use rubber inserts here and there. You know, it's crazy. Yeah, it was pretty much, there was nothing for us, and there was no gator backs, there was nothing. I mean, guys would use, you know, leather with different things, and, you know, even being dragged and stuff, would be, le- you know, layers of, of leather with, with sheepskin or something like that, you know, and harnesses were, it was just basically just just webbing and stuff like that, and, and you know, like a webbing harness kind of stuff, or, or even even rappelling and rope stuff and even stuff the stuff you just tie rope around you and do stuff i remember rappelling and, and doing stuff with just rope you know as a harness but um but yeah it's like in my stunt bag it was basically there is you and you go around you go to the you know go around to the football store you know play place that had football supplies baseball supplies you know it's motorcycle stuff um if there's hockey, because because hockey wasn't that big in LA, it'd be very rare to find hockey stuff. But if you were lucky enough to go to Canada, you'd buy some stuff in Canada. <laughs> and then plus I was smaller, so there's nothing that really fit me. So you have to modify it or buy kids stuff. And then like like I know you saw the back pad I a long time ago, and it was just basically neoprene, yeah. you know, close sound neoprene, and I cut it to a shape to cover my back, and then I put elastic on there, on you know punch hole in there and tie elastic on there for shoulder straps and then I get a kidney belt and tie it around me and that was you know pre pre all the gator backs but um but and I did some did some really you know great falls with that you know flat backs and stair falls and getting you know and time if there is ratchet get, you know it'd be a hard ratchet to a wall or something like that but it was basically a neoprene that's what i used and cut to my size and then in fact when the first gator back came out i was like a little bit leery because i'm going well there's not really any there's you know it's got a hard shell but there's not really any padding on it. Totally, <laughs> so, totally. like, so but you know and then you know everybody uses it but yeah even in the pinch now if if you know, if we don't have something, if we, if I can get some neoprene or something, I can make something out of it, and, you know, and, uh, and you know, be really safe, safe doing it. Cause I know I, that's what I use. <laughs> That's crazy. And now along the lines with that of like predating a lot of pre-existing materials, one of the things that I think you're very well known for is kind of like the introduction of the role of a fight coordinator on television shows or having, you know, a separation of titles between those things. Because uh, I know that one of the reasons why you're able to have the contract that you have right now that you kind of explained to me back in the day was 
uh, a show wanted you to basically do both to stunt coordinate and also come up with the fights. And you basically explain to them like that's two separate roles, you know? And so you basically like came up with a way to justify that you should, uh, you know, if you're going to do both of those roles, get a certain rate that covers both of those. Um, but do you remember like what was one of your first jobs as like a fight coordinator, like actually like just exclusively working on and designing fight scenes and choreography? I think exclusively on a, I mean, I was called in a lot of times back then I would be called in and there was no title for that. Totally, totally. And, you know, if you help working out with a, you get a phone call from a friend that's saying, hey man, can you come in and help me set up something? And I was, I was fortunate enough that I, because, because I did have martial arts background, which I kept, didn't tell people right away that I, I had. Because I wanted to learn the stunt business, and I didn't want to get pigeonholed as the Asian, you know, martial arts guy or the fight guy. So I, because I wanted to learn the stunt industry, so I didn't tell a lot of people um, that much that I had that, you know, that extensive background in martial arts. Um, so, but so I would be coordinating, uh, you know, stunt coordinating. Fortunately, I was able to just stunt coordinate without having to be titled as a just a fight fight guy but um but guys would call me in and say uh, can you come in and help me with this and uh, or if you're playing this part can you set help set up some of the fights and um, so i but then at the time there's nothing and you'd be called a technical advisor yeah. basically that was your title and uh, which could be mean, mean anything right but um so you just go and do that and but i think the first time that it was i had to like go in for a show and it was a big show it was probably um might have been born i think born born uh born, born um, the second born i think the first born um they i had talked to them about stuff but i didn't actually work on the show okay, okay. um and sort of uh, and i know uh, but the second one they called me back and wanted me to do that. And I said, if I come on there, um, cause they said, this is a big show where we want, there's so much work that we want to have. And I think it's enough, it's too much work for one coordinator. So we want to know if you could come in and coordinate this. And uh, we're going to have one guy doing all the car stuff and then you can do all the other stuff with, you know, fights and whether a gun player or whatever. And, um, and then we sort of, you know, integrate together depending upon what's going on. So that was probably the f one of the first shows that came on as a fight, a stunt fight coordinator, um, uh, or yeah, and uh, or fight stunt coordinator, but sl fight slash stunt coordinator, or vice versa, whatever. But but the thing is that I said if I'm coming over there, I, I have some other jobs coming up, and if so, you're gonna and I'm still putting in the time as if I'm a stunt coordinator, you know, just coordinating the whole show. So. Um, so you have to give me this, if you want to give me a separate credit, plus keep my same rate as a stunt coordinator, because I'm still doing the work. I'm still giving you a budget. I'm still putting together, you know, doing all the jobs. It's just that I'm, we're splitting up the scenes. Yeah. So I'll be doing part of it and they'll be doing part of it. So that, so I think that's where that separation started happening, you know, where I was uh, stunt coordinating and, and uh, fight stunt coordinating. So, okay. Okay. Uh, and uh and and i said fine if you if you guys want to pay me the same and i have less you know less responsibility that's that's fine with me <laughs> totally, totally. no that's really cool and that's a perfect segue too because i think that's one of the projects that a lot of people uh identified and like associate very closely with your career and the impact that you had upon like fight choreography and stylistic approaches to it uh was the born series and i know you got to help uh coordinate a bunch of those including the video game but one question I've always had for you that maybe you could just like dispel on here publicly for everyone out there is one of the things that Bourne was most known for, quote unquote, is what people used to refer to as like the shaky cam style and like really approaching things where it was shot like very differently handheld as opposed to these, you know, the different coverage that used to be was, you know, quote unquote, traditional fight coverage. What was the intention behind that? Like, I know, I think you've talked to me about this before. You said your intention wasn't for it to be shaky cam. It was just that was the way that they shot it handheld or something like that yeah because paul greengrass was the director on that and yeah that was more his style of shooting it was more like 
docu style of you know real life kind of being in there and kind of thing. So so it was uh, so it was using it was used, that was that was his vision of how he wanted to shoot stuff. And so we sort of had to tie that in with the. Uh, choreography and making sure you can you know hopefully see everything and stuff and and uh, keep it more keep it like alive and real and that's that's more paul greengrass's uh, uh, style of what he wanted so i I try to generally when i work with a director i'll I'll find out um, you know trying to get in his head about what his vision is and what he wants to see and and uh and then i'll also work talk to the actors and see what you know how they are with their characters and i'll and i'll break down the characters myself but but i I just want to make sure we're all in sync together so we're you know creating the same vision um and depending upon if they're doing handheld or they're doing steady cam or they're on sticks and stuff then you want to try and you know set it up so that you can capture those moments for, for the big screen Okay, and now I know in uh, 2007 you won a SAG award for like best stunt ensemble for Born Ultimatum. But uh, predating that, in 1985 you won a best fight sequence at the first ever Stuntman's Award. And do you remember what project that was? That was, I think it was t- that was a TV show. That was for Knight Rider, I think. Ah. I think it was Knight Rider. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it was Knight Rider. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah, they're they're hoping to have some more stunt awards after that, but I think there was only one or two back then, and then it, then it you know went away. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that was a long time ago. <laughs> I just had to ask because I just didn't know that one. So like these are questions I've always wanted to know the answers to. And now like of all the credits that you've had, like you've like we said you've amassed over four hundred credits at this point between film, TV, music videos, and commercials and stuff. One of the ones that was on your IMDb that like I've always I've never gotten to to ask you about was uh you got to stunt coordinate Eight Mile with Eminem. Yeah. No way. That is super cool. And like, obviously, like, it's not a stunt heavy action movie. But to me, that's just like an iconic movie that, uh, you know, still plays on TV to this day and age. Like, it, it's crazy. That's a pretty iconic movie in uh, in hip hop culture, you know? Yeah, it was, it was interesting because I worked with Curtis Hansen, the director before that, on uh, LA Confidential. And, uh, and he called me up and said, you know, you're going to send me a script. Eric wanted me to work on the project. And it had to do with Eminem, and it, you know, it was a rap movie. And I'm going, oh, really? And I go, okay. And it, it was just like, um, and uh, you know, and everybody talked about, and you know, Marshall and stuff. Eminem being, you know, they go, oh, you know, I wonder how he really is, you know, getting, you know, see all that. But the guy was such a such a not great guy, super creative, very humble, very um, respectful. I mean, always said thanks, said thank you to everybody at the end of the day. He said, you know, so I mean. He was just really a great guy, and then, then while we're shooting that, he was actually laying in, uh, you know, laying in tracks for the for the soundtrack. You know, he's trying to he's composing stuff. He had a trailer off to the side, so while he wasn't on screen, he was over there doing uh, composing stuff for the soundtrack. And uh, but yeah, he's he did a really great job, and that was his first acting job too. Yeah. So he took him a while to get used to like, okay, why are we doing this again for t- there to take two? Why are we doing this again? So take three, and why do you want me? So once he saw started seeing dailies, I mean, he caught him really quick, and he started he started saying, oh yeah, I see why he wanted me to do this to the you know about the director and giving him a different direction or why he wanted to do it again and things like that. So or you know camera angles and stuff, but. But first he was a little like, oh, why are we still here? Why are we doing this so many times? So, but um, but yeah, it was a lot of fun. And there, yeah, there wasn't a lot of stunts in there. It was like some little big car stuff, little safety stuff, little, you know, some you know small fights yeah, and game yeah, fight stuff. And, and uh, yeah, and but yeah, and most of the time I was using the actors, you know, because uh, it, because also we we're going to be in there. As, and we're going to see everybody's faces, so I, you know, try to make it, ex- I make fairly exciting, real, but not, you know, and you don't want it to not fit the movie either. You don't want it to be outrageous because, you know, it's, it's not about that, not having these humongous fights or, you know, getting people thrown all over the place because they're not superheroes, they're not trained, they're just guys, you know, they're guys that are 
growing up, you know, in the neighborhood near some street guys and, you know, street gang guys and different things. So, so it's sort of, it was, a lot, it was a lot of fun, but yeah, that was pretty iconic to do that. And I remember talking to Curtis Hansen about it going, I have to ask you, you know, we did LA Confidential, you've done River One Rod, you've done all these other films, but you're doing a rap film? He goes, yeah, he goes, I was just sort of interested in that culture. So I thought I, you know, I'm researching it and then, you know, thought I'd write, you know, do this, do this movie. And so, so it's also, for Curtis, it was also just him sort of expanding his, his knowledge about, you know, another, another area of, you know, like in the music world and stuff, because he always liked music too. You know? But yeah, it was interesting. So it was, it was, it was, it was great, great experience. That's cool. And along the lines of working with like, you know, people that are iconic within the music industry and artists that are, you know, going to re- be remembered for generations to come. Uh, one of the other projects that I know personally, because I have talked to you about this one before, is you got to work on and I believe coordinate the Michael Jackson video for You Rock My World, which was one of the like highest budget music videos for back in the day, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, was it really? I didn't know. Yeah, it's, it's pretty big, yeah. And I, I think I remember one of the funniest things about it was that you guys were like on on a, you guys like, I don't know if you were on a studio lot or not, but it was like going to take course over the duration of like a week or something like that, as opposed to a lot of music videos, which are single day shoots, maybe, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it was, it was, it was a pretty good, pretty elaborate set. We we're on back lot of, we we're in the universal stages and, um, and I got called in did you call me? I worked on some other sh- shows with this guy, and he called me, and then, uh, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was like, okay, working with Michael Jackson, that'd be cool, you know. So, um, and then I actually um, had David Wall double, double him. Yeah. People were like, David Wall double Michael Jackson, and I, but I looked at David's features and you know his eyes and his features, and I go, he'd be really good to double Michael Jackson, you know? And cause I calling around to see if it's, cause he's super thin, right? And I called a lot of the black stunt guys and guys that I would think, and I checked with some of the guys and I said, am I missing anybody before I do this? And are you, are you guys cool if I hire David to, you know, to double Michael Jackson? Cause I, you know, it's, he's like super thin and, and tall and stuff. And, and, uh, and there's nobody else that could, you know, fit that description and then could do what I wanted to do. So. So after searching for all the stunt guys that I knew, black stunt guys, and talking to some of the coordinators that are friends of mine that are coordinating and stuff, and I said, is there anybody I'm missing? They said, no, and so they, I hired Davey. But it was funny because to David's testament, you know, to, testament to Davey, he, when he had the makeup on and he had the clothes on and everything else, um, it was funny, we were standing off to the side and Michael was in his trailer. And the producer just about had a cow, he was like, he like freaked out because he saw us across the street because we're there is like an exterior scene of a car and then explosion and different things like that and um, but we were standing across the street and i was checking stuff out to look at stuff from the distance and then i was going to go on with trolls to the set but i had somebody come up to me and they go oh they go oh is that mike oh that's not michael and they go no and i go oh and then they got on the radio and they called and then they then the producer called me and he goes he goes, man, he goes, you thought gave me a heart attack. He goes, what's Michael doing on the set? He goes, we're not ready for him or anything. And he goes, that was Davey? I go, yeah. And so we walked over there and, because he hadn't seen Davey in, in, in the wardrobe and the makeup and everything. He goes, man, you look just like him. <laughs> so he goes, so he goes, well, good. You know, that's good. And he's practicing walking like him and having his mannerisms and stuff. So, so it, it paid off really well. But that was a fun show. They had... Um, and it was cool because I, I like music and the dance dancing and stuff. Yeah. And so it was fun to integrate the music and dance stuff with, you know, with action. And because it's, you know, it's all plays together. And uh, and at the time, the choreographers were um, a couple guys from Carson to some, to uh, Rich, and Rich, Rich, and Rich and Tone. Yeah. yeah. And they're like nervous as hell too. They're like, Oh man, I hope he likes this stuff. I go, you worked with him before? They go, no. And I go, and he goes, do you work with him? I go, no. And he go, and I go, and so they're doing it. And it was, it was really cool to see Michael come in and just, you know, they're like 
Frick, man, Michael Jackson. <laughs> so he okay. comes up the set and he goes, okay, so what you guys got? And then they show him, he goes, well, if that's okay with you, and da da da. And he goes, we need to exchange. He goes, no, let me see it again. So I think Michael watched it like maybe two, three times. And he goes, okay, let me try it. And he goes, we'll help you with it. And he goes, yeah. So, I mean, he just like picked it up just like that, made a few minor changes or suggestions, you know, more suggestions and minor, some minor changes. But he was like, the guys were, everybody's like, Especially those guys, were, yeah, he picked that up so fast just watching it, you know, because, you know, Michael's a pro. He like, grew up doing all that stuff, right? So um, it was a lot of fun. And then he, and then Michael, when we were doing all the, the, the fights and different things like that, it was funny because he, he came up, he was, he was like, he was, oh man, he goes, he goes, you guys, he goes, I'm so impressed. He goes, he goes, I could never do anything like that. He, <laughs> You guys, you guys are so amazing to do all that stuff. And well, I said, Michael, you could do it right now. Totally. I could never do anything like that. You're so graceful. So it's so beautiful to watch and, you know, the movements and everything. Remember when, Michael, you're the king of pop. Yeah, yeah. Man. You can do all this stuff, you know, the locking and stuff like that, all these different things. I could, I could modify what you're doing. I go, do this move that you're doing in the dance. You did the move. And I said, all you have to do is change this, adjust this a little bit. And it's a martial arts move or it's a fight move. And he goes, no, no, I couldn't. I go, no, you're doing it right now. And I probably should have talked to him more about it and like said, if you ever want to do that, I can work with you and you can easily, you know, and he, he, honestly, he could have easily picked all that stuff right, you know, without without a problem because of his dance background yeah, yeah. and his understanding of body mechanics. But but it was so, it was nice, it was a nice compliment, but, but at the same time, he's going, I could never do it like you guys. I said, yes, you could, man. <laughs> <laughs> you and I both know, like we always joke about it. Dancers learn insanely fast. Like we're we're always trying to convert female dancers into being stunt women because they pick up choreography so quick, and more so, just like the mastery and knowing your body just really translates well to fight choreography eventually. Yeah, and, and as you know, they're you know they're used to working hard, and they're used to you know, I mean, being in pain. And I mean, not that we want anybody to be in pain, but they're used to working hard and being and being very dedicated to what they're doing so and like you said they're you know they know their bodies the, the other thing is that they're used to choreography because yeah, yeah. i tell everybody all the time Michael, when you're when you're fighting somebody it's basically everybody's your dance partner totally, totally. right and, and you're only as good as your dance partners because I, you can throw the best punch in the world or the best kick in the world but if your dance partner can't react properly then you know it looks horrible yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like the versa you know right? if, you know the other people just like working with the actors you know, I tell the actors, I go, this, I go, we're going to learn this, learn these sections, and, you know, and you'll want you to be super comfortable, but all these guys are here to make you look good and to support you, and, you know, so it, you, it, everything's going to be integrated to be where it's, it's like a dance. It's, you know, we're doing a dance, but it's going to be a violent dance. <laughs> exactly. With some people dying. <laughs> And you know, a lot of times, like you said, it's, I, you know, if I had a choice, I'd prefer sometimes, you know, if you have a great, really good fighter, you know, MMA fighter, boxer, somebody who actually fights, sometimes it's, I mean, it is a whole different skill set to be able to do movie stuff. You know, people think, oh, you can hire a bunch of black belts or MMA fighters or something, you can throw them in there and they'll do movie fights, and it's not the case. I mean, some guys can adapt pretty quickly, but not, every, you know, most people... They're trained to do what they're doing specifically. And, you know, for them to do a big head reaction and take their eyes off their opponent or whatever, that's not how they're trained to do stuff. You know, you're trained to like take the hits and just be focused on that one one area. And you're not, and to do a big reactions or over exaggerate moves and punches, that's not efficient, but it looks good on screen. So it's, they, they just, it takes a, either they get it or they don't get it. and. Uh, and so a lot of times it's, it's sometimes preferable to have some dancers do stuff, you know, and you have to change the focus of where the PowerPoint is, where the area of, of impact is and, and maybe change their hip, you know, the movements of how their hips are set and stuff like that because dancers are opposite of, of martial artists and stuff, but, and uh, just, you know, make adjustments. But a lot of times, like, you know, like you like you said too, it's just you know it's you can make those adjustments with them much easier. You just have to make sure that they don't look too fluid yes, and yes, dancey. Yes. But but um, but you know it's at least you know they understand choreography and they understand that 
not everything's going to be perfect every time, you know, and they, they have a goal to set and they can, and they'll work hard to get, get to that point. Now th- this may be a hard question to ask. Uh, and some people it's, it's hard for them to pick one between the two, but, uh, of all the films that you've gotten to design action and fights on from like Iron Man 2 to Hannah, Total Recall, uh, Fast and Furious 7 to Sleepless, is there a project that's been your most favorite or maybe like most rewarding that you were uh, happy to see the final end results on screen or one you're most proud of? Um, a lot of times the stuff you're most proud of, or at least for me, is that ended up on the editing floor. <laughs> so like, cool. Or they've cut it up in a certain way that you know, you may not agree with, or, you know, things that we're asked to do in one, they sort of cut it up, you know, and then you didn't have to do it in one. There's no reason to have to do it all in one, like a one or as we call it. But um, I'd say, um, I know there's something about all of them that was was fun and rewarding, but I'd say like, um, I think like uh, total, you brought up total recall, yeah, yeah. right? Total Recall that we make was was challenging and fun because um, the director said instead of doing something in, in a circular motion going around the fight or the you know the shootout and the fight, he goes, um, I want to be more linear because I want to do quick camera movements where they cross each other. And it's like boom, boom, and boom, boom, like this. And uh, he goes, Can you do that? And I said, well, Yeah, you know, we figure it out. But the thing is, it's like, I think it was like 30 foot track and the camera was moving at 22 feet per second or something. Wow, wow. that's crazy. The track or something, I can't remember exactly, but but uh, but the challenging part was to, because you can't run that fast <laughs> over the camera to grab the shot. So it was, I mean, you could get up to speed, but it was like to go and be, you know, have hard lines to cut and, and be real linear and be up to speed at, at that cons- consistently. So I choreographed the fight and then sort of imagined in my head how fast we're going, you know, do it slow motion and try and make sure that, you know, you're, you're seeing everything yeah. and you're seeing the guns and, the dis- you know, whatever disarmed or the punches and the kicks or whatever. And then, um, and then I had to, uh, t- I timed it out and then I, Basically, it's the first time I've ever used a metronome <clears throat> and a stopwatch. Crazy. And I really had to work it out mathematically, you know, where everything would be at a certain time. And, and it picked the, picked the camera speed that was fast enough that we can capture everything that was consistently that that sweet spot. Yeah, yeah, where yeah, you yeah. Grab, In you the know, right, the right window. Grab it. Yeah. And then also adjust the guys to be, you know, to maybe sell the punches a little bit better, the kicks or the, or the gun play or the disarms and stuff. Um, so you had to, so it was, it was challenging in that way, but it was a lot of fun to do. But I never forget it was like, and then the guys, the camera operators, the guys who I felt bad for, because they're on, they're on wheels, man. They're doing it manually. Like, you catch know, catch it's on a, yeah. They're, um, they're, uh, so it wasn't like, it was an automatic, camera move where it's you know all like motion control shot or something like that because you can't go that fast but it's like but everything was on a on a winch you know which is tra- traveling on a winch it's like the speed was was really computerized and everything else so the guys there's three camera guys you know operating the cameras because we could do three pieces of track at a time and so you go one to the next one to the next one and they'd overlap you know and come through and so they can uh they can uh, put the two, scene, two two pieces of footage yeah, together. Stitch them together. Yeah, yeah. Stitch them together. So, so but the next guy had to be right there and pick up this, pick up the camera angle as this one came by like this, you know. So it was pretty funny, and I knew the the camera operators. And, uh, one of them in particular was also the DP. It was also a DP too, and and he'd be on the going like this. And, ah, dang it! Let's do it again. So, and I felt bad for him, but, but, you know, it was challenging for him, but he had a good time too. So, um, so that was a lot of fun, but I'll never forget. It was like, okay, counting it down, you know, 
one and two and three it's like a dance like a dancer one and two and three and four and you know action kind of thing so and colin farrell was doing it and he you know i go on and you're going to do this and then this you're going to do this and you know had everybody else set up but had a stopwatch and a metronome and everything had to be on certain count and camera guys are waiting for the count for the metronome and stuff like that <laughs> so that was that was quite challenging and rewarding um and then um like book of eli was fun because it was like a uh, had a couple winners in there uh they had the silhouetted underpass shot which we did and uh and then also the bar fight which was initially shot all in one but they ended up shooting some close-ups and stuff and uh and then ended up breaking it up to get you know tight a little bit tighter shots of denzel but denzel actually did was it you guys was seven you guys was that 17 guys in in 32 seconds or something yeah, I think like that. 17 or 18 guys yeah yeah so and initially they wanted to do um have it last about that long with five guys <laughs> or four guys and they said unfortunately if it was with with his fists we can have guys get back up but he's got a sword oh, so <laughs> he has a sword they're dead. They're, get back up again <laughs> easily so so we had more people in and that was a motion control shot and i worked out the speed you know with them to to capture everything and uh that was a lot of fun getting all those people in there and, and denzel you know did it all himself so very did a great job but you know, it's it's just that the audience will never know that he did it all in one because they cut it up into kind of pieces, and that's you know. And the Hughes brothers, they wanted to do sort of an homage to Bruce Lee and Enter the Dragon, where the camera is locked off and Bruce is in in the in the in the, uh, in the prison where they're all breaking out of prison. And he's fighting everybody coming in you know on camera and stuff like that we go we want to do something like that but you know have it all in one but circular coming around and, and can fight all these guys and he's in the center fighting everybody like bruce lee was you know so so um, so it was a net it was initially set up to be all presented and sh- you know sh- it was shot in one and it was supposed to be all presented in one um but it that was that was fun too and then fight club was fun because it fight club was another movie that i uh, they called me in to help out on and, and um, that one was at least there was we didn't have a lot of time to train people mm-hmm. and uh, Mike Brunyard was a coordinator main coordinator and he wanted me to come in to help and stuff and and uh, they had not a lot of not a huge amount of time to, to prep but they're tr- planning on training everybody to be a boxer wrestling you know um, uh doing kicking, you know, I mean, just all these different disciplines and train everybody to be really good and then have them do all the fights because they wanted a mixture of stuff. But I, I said, well, one thing, Fight Club is supposed to be about guys who don't know how to fight necessarily. Yeah, exactly. Right. And that's what was refreshing because it was not like he's like the best covert agent in the world and he's not the best, you know, policeman or he's not the best, uh, uh, you know, maybe seal guy or anything like that it was like these guys are guys you know, we're, we're living and they're doing underground hiding stuff and, and so it was i just said let's if, if we train them all in the same disciplines and get them all up to you know to be really good you're gonna have to tear them all down again to be not know how to fight and the thing is but they're gonna all have the same sort of mannerisms and skills set because they've all been trained the same so I said, we don't have a lot of time, so let's train him. Let's, I'll train him, but at the same time, it's supposed to be scrappy, it's supposed to be messy. And uh, I'll use their characters and their natural attributes to be able to, to break down how to, how to you know, do the fights and st- how, how their characters can fight. And, um, and then as they progress through the movie, then they can get start getting better and we'll figure out some signature moves that they like to do or something like that. But, but it was uh, refreshing because they no longer had to be like the elite, the best, you know, fighters in the world or the best, um, you know, guys in want to do guns and different things like that. So, or best drivers or anything. So it was, it was refreshing the fact that, that, um, you know, it was like 
watching guys in junior high fight or something like that at the beginning, you know, rolling around and not knowing what they're doing and struggling with each other and, you know, and uh, just being really sloppy. So it was sort of, that, that part was a lot of fun. And then, but then working on stuff to get them look better and better. Uh, it's an iconic movie too. Super iconic. And now I've had a lot of, uh, uh, stunt coordinators on the show before and so I'm not going to ask you the question I've asked them which is like what advice do you give to people to get into stunts I'm going to ask you something a little different targeted towards guys out there that are very interested in fight choreography and fight coordinating and stuff like that uh, kind of like a two-parter so like however you want to answer this is uh, what's your approach to choreography and at this stage in your career how are you able to continue to come up with fresh stuff and try not to repeat the same movements over and over again um, the way I, tr I tr try and uh, not come up with the same things over and over again is that I don't work. I try not to work at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, Limited opportunities to repeat yourself. Unless I work, unless I can, I, you know, the, opportunity, the opportunity is there to re repeat myself. No, it's um, no it's, uh, I'd say uh, my approach is more organic, I guess. Um, I guess that's because that's what people were saying at the beginning when I was doing stuff. And it's sort of uh, it, part of how I came up because of Bruce Lee's influence and, and Jeet Kune Do and, and Danny Asano and everything else, because it's about adapting and fitting in and, you know, and not, you can't go in with an expectation of how, what, what's going to happen exactly. So um, I will, and, and it's just the same thing with doing stunts and as a stunt coordinator, you know, it's like you show up at a street and they're going to do some car stuff and you can't, you know, there may be a hill there or something, or there may be, um, you know, maybe the, instead of two, two lanes on each side, there's three or there's one lane or something, or it's maybe one way. And all of a sudden they're going, oh, we're going to move over here. And it's a one way street. So whatever plan you had, you had to sort of like, okay, well, I can't go the wrong way on the one way street anymore. So we're going to have to figure something out or cross traffic's only going one direction. So, so it's about adapting and, and just, you know, and, but you know, keeping things safe, but being creative with the environment that you're, you're presented and, um, that's why, you know, even even when you go, as you know, you go location scouting, you got everything locked in and all of a sudden they're going, oh, we lost that location or we can't stay there that long or we can't, we're losing the light so we can only shoot this way. And so can you create something that only happens this direction instead of doing, so you have to like try and figure out how to capture those, those action moments uh, regardless of what kind of action. Yeah. And, uh, so you sort of adapt that to, to fights and stuff too. But I'd say um, you have to, I would, I would say that the approach is basically, you know, get well-versed in, in a lot of, if it's fights or even cars or anything, to immerse yourself in that stuff so that you understand how a car trap can move or travel or slide or something like that. Or, and then doing fights is like, okay, what's, you know, if the more systems, you know, or styles of fighting, the better, um, because, you know, some, and a lot of times you don't want a specific style, but if you all of a sudden somebody's doing Tai Chi, it's good to know some Tai Chi to be able to present it properly rather than, you know, making, you know, uh, making French savate, trying, trying to make that look like Tai Chi or something like that, you know, it's like, um, but, or if you want somebody to do French savate, you know, that's for a unique style too. So all of them have their unique, uh, signature type of look. And so it'd be good to learn all that stuff, uh, learn about, you know, all the, all the, uh, all the kicking and everything else, and then be able to, uh, use pieces of that and integrate it to fit the characters and the scene and the storyline. Um, everything is very important to be able to choreograph, you know, the proper action, regardless of whether it's fights or anything else, because you want it to fit in for the movie and also the characters. Uh, so I'd say that, and then, and then just, um, for me, I, you know, I mean, fortunately I grew up, like I said, you know, from my exposure to, to doing full contact stuff and things like that. You know what hurts, what really feels, you know, what you can do in a real situation, what's too flashy and, you know, but I mean, for, for screen, for on screen, you know, you have to sort of 
give a little, a little more because things have to last longer. And also being in some fights myself and, and also, you know, getting, you know, taking your licks in class and stuff like that. You know that, you know, some stuff you try is not going to work. So, so it's a matter of what you want to do in the scene that that's believable or over the top if it's you know if it's a fantasy film or things like that so you really have to look at what you know if it's a superhero thing or a fantasy film or a period film or present day you have to look at all the all that all those aspects and, and take that in consideration when you're choreographing things and then i just sort of um try and be as organic as possible there may be some signature you know some specific moves i may want to integrate someplace but i don't try and block something out where okay you're going to you throw a right punch, I'm going to block this. You throw a left punch, you know, or you, you block this and you do this. Uh, for me, it's, um, I just like to be more organic about it and let people help me. Uh, I'm, I'm more reactionary. So if somebody's attacking me, I'm going to react. And I'm not going to say this is exactly what I'm going to do because you may do something coming ahead on at me doing one thing. And that, and if you all of a sudden you're over here or somebody, you know, instead of over, instead of in front of me, you're on the side of me, I can't, may not be able to do that exact same move. So something else may come out and it may be better and it may be not, but I'm going to, you know, we'll find out when, yeah, either that or maybe I'll get hit. <laughs> I know this firsthand from helping you where you would literally just be like, feed me, and I just throw punches at you over and over again, and you'll do 25 different things, and you're like, what was the third thing I did? I like that one. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. You did 25 things on me, man. <laughs> I know. I, I'm bad that way. I, I don't – I sort of just do it, and then it feels good, and I go – and then we do something else, and I go, which one was that one? And so – Fortunately, if somebody's, you know, trying to have the camera rolling yes, or yes. something or, you know, somebody with a, with, a, with their phone and just sort of let it go while I'm doing stuff and then pick out stuff that, you know, because it's like, yeah, what was that third thing? Or was that, what was that move I did there? And, you know, but, um, or that move you did to, you know, kind of thing. So, so it's sort of a, yeah, I know people have told me that that's, I'm, I'm sure people are doing it more now, but I don't know, but. Before, no, I don't, people were telling me nobody choreographed that way yeah, no, no. <laughs> a long time ago. And that's just sort of how, how I've always done it, you know, because to me, I don't know if, if I'm playing a part, a character, and I'm at a certain level of training, I don't know how this guy is going to attack me. So why don't you just attack me? Totally. You know, and I tell him just, and luckily some guys, you know, you try and get some guys who actually have fight background or been in fights and they know what's real and what can't, what, you know, what's bad. And the, and the worst thing is, you know, if you have three people attacking you, it's like, okay, one guy attacks and the other two guys are waiting. Well, you know, if you guys were all three standing there, would you wait? No. So just come. <laughs> right? so, so it's, it's, I, you know, I don't know. You tell me, is there other guys that, yeah, I'm sure a lot of people do, do more of that now, but, um, I think it's changing, you know, it, it's changing more so, but, but then again, there are a lot of guys that like kind of just do it from an outside perspective where like, I think they just block down, like this should happen, this should happen, this should happen, as opposed to being more reactionary, kind of like what you're talking about. You know, it's definitely something unique. I've worked on a lot of shows and been a part of a lot of different processes. And uh, as a result of like being able to assist you and having that chance, I very much go about things the same way where I literally just tell guys like feed me and I'll just roll the camera and I'll be like, Oh, that flowed good. We're going to stick with that. That, that seems to work better here as opposed to just sticking to a game plan that you have by drawing the X's and O's out from the start, you know? Yeah. And sometimes it's, you know, some, of the, some nice stuff comes out that for me, it's been that way. I mean, the underpass flight, uh, Eli and book of Eli with, you know, with the, um, with, you know, with, Denzel, um, and it's a sword and stuff that I, I threw that together and people say, oh, we threw that together in like 20 minutes or something or within, within a half an hour. Um, and that doesn't happen all the time, but you know, I mean, it happens, <laughs> you can, it can happen for you. In other fights, you get sort of stumped and you have to wait, stick, you have to keep playing with stuff, you know. Um, I know on Green Hornet, the, the house fight, and it was uh, Seth Rogen's character in the guest house, that fight with him and Cato. Mm -hmm. You know, 
were there for a while and he got all these things in there and they, you know, I could use whatever I wanted, all the toys that he had and, you know, different things. And, and uh, you know, sometimes it, it took a little while for me to get, get the beat on, you know, get that, the creative juices going. But once, once you start going, it's like, okay, no, do this, do this, do this, come here, go over here and you, and you jump through, you know, see what happens when you jump through here or you do this or something like that. But it's, you know, it's just, it's sort of like you really are an artist or you're like a music composer or, you know, musician or something like that. And we're a writer and you, you know, you, sometimes you're in the groove and you just flow with it and everything just flows like this. And other times you sit, stand there and go, I don't know, we can do this. Oh no, I've done that before. Oh, we can do this. Oh, that's been done before. You know, so you want to, like you said, you want to, you don't want to do everything, anything twice. And although, you know, punch is a punch, but you know, maybe the reaction, maybe the response is a little bit different. So make it a little bit different or the environment's different, which makes it different. Or, or um, maybe you have one arm that's hurt or you're holding a, holding something that you can utilize, you know, a bag or something or whatever. Um, but, but uh, it's pretty much, a cre- it is very much a creative process. It's not like, you know, it's not like we're cowboys, you know, and we're just making up a bar fight. That's, you know, that's, um, you know, in the old days I was taught, grab a, grab a big handful and come through and throw a punch, and grab a big handful, come through and throw a punch. And, you know, all these, you know, trapping moves and different things like that. It was like, you can't do that kind of stuff, you know? You can't, the cha- ca- camera will never get it. You can't see it. You can't do that kind of stuff. You're going, you know, or you, or swinging something and doing it. You can't do that. You know, it's like too fast. You can't, it'll never show up. And you gotta, you gotta really make it big and John Wayne, which, which that's what's how, how I learned. And I'm going, well, as long as you're crossing the line for, for impacts and stuff, why can't you do other stuff? And why, you know, why can't the camera move more and be more fluid rather than just, you know, being here and then you can't do anything on the low line. You can't do shink. You can't do low line kicks. Yeah, all the kicks have to be up here. You know, so why not? Why can't we move the camera down and come back up? You know, if the camera operator is good enough, or if I can operate the camera myself, you can grab all this stuff. So, so that's the other part. Is like the frustrating part. A lot of times is, can the camera capture it the way you? envision right you, you run across that yourself a lot where you know you know you can it can be done it's just a matter of having a talented camera guy to be able to help help you get that captured right or or even in the editing room if the editor knows knows how to cut it together you provide all the pieces and then if they don't understand it they can pick all the worst stuff <laughs> or even like even even an editor cutting dialogue you know the dialogue is all there and the, all the coverage is there but if, if they're not good at editing and what you you know what you're going to end up with is not what you envision so so there's all these it's not only us in our department and our people it's you know everybody that helps create the film itself you know the wardrobe people can, can help hair people can help or make things worse because you know wardrobe maybe they'll have high heels on and you want something for the women and you say well for this action piece and they're running across some grate we need something where their heels aren't going to get stuck in the grate and they don't give you anything or you know or they have to do they have to you know run and jump or run downstairs and and maybe it's too dangerous to run in heels and if they can't help you with with wardrobe then it's going to affect the action and how you and the camera guys if they can't get there in time to grab the action then you're not going to see anything so so it's all everybody is very important to get what we see on the screen and uh, and, and get that moment in time that we all envisioned you know so um, so it's a matter of working together and and building that trust and that and that foundation of, of talent to be able to all come together and making making it exciting for the for the audience to be able to watch and it doesn't always happen as you know <laughs> we've worked on some together <laughs> oh man no i think that's i think that's a great great advice and especially from someone with the expertise and you know number of years and experience that you've had it's a uh, it's not going to fall on deaf ears and stuff like that and so uh you know, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to do all this stuff. But like, before we get out of here, I always ask this one question to every single one of my guests. And uh, I'm very interested to hear what you have to say about it. So uh, where do you see Jeff Amata five years from now? And what about 10 years from now? Um, well, it's a good question. I'm still trying to figure out what I want to do when I grow up. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> 
I mean, I'd like, you know, I've been offered stuff to direct over the years, but it was either, you know, uh, the script wasn't good or the, the cast that they, the, you know, actor that they picked was not super experienced or whatever. And, and I just really didn't want to have my first uh, venture out directing be something that was already um, challenging in that respect of not being up to my up to par. Um, so directing, producing something that, you know, something where, you know, you walk out of the theater and you, and you, and sure it's great. I call them, you know, we all call them, you know, some of us call them popcorn films where it's like, oh, that was cool, cool, fun, fun film to watch and, you know, eat popcorn and everything else, but you walk out and it's, it's done, it's over with, but it'd be nice to, it's nice to have something where you walk out and it either has a message or something memorable or opens up conversation about something and, and has a longer lasting impact on your life. So it'd be good to be able to, have be able to tell a story in that manner where you know has a longer has more of a message i mean i like action but at the same time and i think action films and all the you know are, are a lot of fun to do but um sometimes it's nice i mean i think it's nice to have a strong message about something when, you know either culturally historically emotionally something where it leaves a lasting impression where it opens up conversation and it doesn't even for me it doesn't even have to be an action film it's just a good story and uh, something you know so maybe directing producing something like that or or um doing some, something completely different i don't know <laughs> <laughs> oh it's crazy no no i totally uh I'm looking forward to seeing what you choose to do next. It'll be cool. I've been a lifelong fan, and uh, more than anything, I appreciate all the opportunities you've given me and helping jumpstart my career in so many ways. You know, uh, without you, I probably wouldn't even be remotely where I'm at in my career. And uh, I thank you so much for all that. Uh, you're, you're very talented, Travis. I, I, I'd be very further, you know, quite far in your career, regardless of whether I was around or not. So, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, but thank you very much. And it's, it's always a pleasure to have you, you know, have you around and working together and, and, uh, you know, knowing your family and everything. So, uh, so keep up the good work and it's a pleasure. Heck yeah. I appreciate it. And, uh, before we get out of here, can you just let people know where they can like stay up to date with you, whether that's like your website or anything you want to shout out so people can look you up? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, I do have a, uh, I have, do, do have jeffymotted.com in my website. It's sort of new. I haven't, I'm not even, I, I have to do something with it. <laughs> and, um, and also uh, on Instagram, uh, jeff.imada, um, which I, that's new too. I, I, I just barely know how to work it. I don't even know how to work it myself. So I need to get, you know, get more on that track of uh, social media but yeah reach me there reach, reach me in those two areas yo guys with that being said please be sure to hit that like button comment subscribe for brand new episodes each and every week join us every monday for jam breakdowns and every friday for brand new jamcast interviewing influential members of the movement community like mr jeff amada himself so with that being said guys i gotta give one more very very special thank you to mr jeff amada for coming through uh, thank you travis it's a pleasure Thanks so much, Jeff. And as always, guys, coming at you, coming through, I'm your host, Travis Wong. Thanks for joining us here on another Jamcast. Until next time, we'll see you all soon. Peace.